Okay. Turtle All right. Um, so today I want to talk a little bit about hyperbolicity. So let me start by introducing um, what's behind some of these ideas. So this starts with suppose that you have a smooth curve of genus at least two over the complex numbers. Then the uniformization theorem says that, so the uniformization theorem says that the only simply connected uh, Riemann surfaces are the Riemann sphere, the complex plane, and the unit disk, right? And, um, you know, once the genus is at least true, then the universal cover, which is the simply connected Riemann surface, is the unit disk. So this is the unit disk, right? Um, so <clears throat> in particular, if you have a curve of genus at least two, then the universal cover is this unit disk. So, it, so you see, and the, the fundamental group of X acts by um, isometries of the unit disk. So that means that the hyperbolic metric on the unit disk descends to give a, you know, hyperbolic metric with constant curvature minus one, right? Uh, so that means that if you have a G curve of genus at least two over the complex numbers, then it has this hyperbolic metric. And in fact, like, you know, the complex structure is uniquely determined by the hyperbolic metric and vice versa. So, um, okay. And so, so on the one hand, we have the uniformization theorem. That's a big theorem. On the other hand, the other big theorem, we have a faulting this theorem, which says that suppose you have a curve of genus at least two defined over a number field, then like the number of rational points on this curve over any number field is finite. So, you know, if you, if you have some curve defined over the rational numbers and you want to solve how many, you want to see how many rational points it has, if its genus is at least two, then it will have only finitely many rational points. So like, you know, for instance, if you write something like X to the N plus Y to the N is equal to Z to the N and N here is bigger than three, then there will be only finitely many solutions of this equation. Okay, so that's that's the, the these are the two big theorems, and so Lang, I guess in the eighties and ninety in the eighties maybe seventies and eighties he asked, I guess it must have been eighties and nineties. So like uh, since this theorem is around eighty three, so then that's shortly after that late eighties early nineties he asked the question. Um, how does this generalize to higher dimensions? So, so, you know, how do we go from curves to higher dimensional varieties? Like what geometric conditions can you put so that, you know, there will be only finitely many solutions to your equations? Um, and then he settled on the notion of hyperbolicity, sort of a generalization of the fact that there is this hyperbolic metric on X, okay? And the correct notion of hyperbolicity that he highlighted is the Kobayashi hyperbolicity. So let me explain this a little bit. So you call a complex manifold Kobayashi hyperbolic if the Kobayashi pseudo distance is actually a distance. So now what's the Kobayashi pseudo distance? So here's how we are going to measure the, the, the distance between two points. So say that I have my X and I have my point P and my point Q. So what you're going to do is, uh, you know, you're going to put disks in your X, holomorphic disks. So what you're going to do is you're going to take a two-pointed disk. So this is like the unit disk. It has two points. So you'll map the first point to P, and it, the second point will map to another one. Then you'll have another disk, and so on and so forth. You'll have this chain of disks, finitely many. And then what you do is that you take the hyperbolic distance between these two points on the, on the disks and you add them up. So this gives you some number, right? And what you do is you minimize this number that you get over all possible holo chains of holomorphic disks you have like this. And this is called the Kobayashi pseudo distance. The reason why it's called the pseudo distance is that this may be zero sometimes. It's not always positive. I mean, it's, it's sometimes zero. So the main example is the following. Suppose I look at the complex numbers, okay? 
say that you, we look at the complex numbers and say that I want to measure the distance between zero and one. So now what am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to put the disk such that two, a two point to this such that one point maps to zero, the other point maps to one. Okay, so take your unit disk right here. I wrote it down. And then, you know, here is our unit disk. And what we could do is we could multiply by R. That's a nice, perfectly nice holomorphic map, right? Multiplication Z goes to RZ, right? That's a nice holomorphic map. And it maps zero to zero and one over R to one, right? And now you see this has some sort of hyperbolic metric. The hyperbolic metric is the hyperbolic metric, like, you know, the, 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 met, the distance between zero and one over R. And, but of course, as R tends to infinity, one over R gets closer and closer to zero. So that you see that like, you know, I can find a family of such things where this distance goes to zero. So then, you know, you conclude that the distance is zero. Okay. So this is telling you that, you know, this is a way of measuring distance, but it doesn't always have to be um, positive. And you call a variety, uh, Kobayashi hyperbolic, a complex manifold Kobayashi hyperbolic, if this is really a distance, so that the distance between any two points is not zero. Okay. So we get a little conclusion from this calculation. So let, let me just point out what that conclusion is. Suppose you have a manifold and you have a non constant map from C. Okay. So if you have a non-constant map from C to this manifold, then the points in the image have to have distance zero, right? Because, <clears throat> you know, so, so like suppose you have your X and you have a non-constant map from the complex numbers, right? Now, if I have two points in there, then you can go back to your complex numbers. They lie to give you two points. And then by playing the same trick, by putting this just in there, that get bigger and bigger, I can make the distance as small as I care. So the other point that I should have made, so you see, the important thing about the hyperbolic metric is that if you have a holomorphic map between two curves, right, this thing is either an isometry or it shrinks distances, right? This is the important, that's Schwartz's lemma, right? So the same holds for the Kobayashi pseudo distance. So like, you know, if you have a holomorphic map between two complex manifolds and you can, you either have an isometry in here or like the distances shrink. So in particular, you see if you have a map from C to X because the distances between two points um, already on C are zero, then in the image they have to shrink. So they have to also be zero, okay? Um, but anyway, he, however way you want to do it. So the important point is that this Kobayashi pseudo distance is not always a distance and you call a manifold hyperbolic if it is a distance, okay? There is a slightly different notion of hyperbolicity and that also comes in handy. So let me introduce that. And this is Brody hyperbolicity. And then you see, you, you take, you, you use this notion that, you know, if you have non-constant maps from C to X, then the points in the image have uh, zero Kobayashi distance. So you use that to define Brody hyperbolicity. You call a manifold Brody hyperbolic if the only holomorphic maps from the complex numbers to X are constant, okay? And then of course, by just what we said here, right? If you have a variety that's Kobayashi hyperbolic, then that immediately implies that it's Brody hyperbolic, okay? Now, the nice theorem from Brody's thesis is that the converse of this is true for compact manifolds. If you have a compact complex manifold um, and it's Brody hyperbolic, then it's Kobayashi hyperbolic. You know, for compact manifolds, these things are equivalent. So in other words, this uh, Kobayashi distance is a distance, Kobayashi pseudo distance is a distance provided that there are no non-constant maps from C to X. Uh, assuming that X is compact. Let, let me point out that this actually is false for non-compact manifolds. Um, for non-compact manifolds, Kobayashi hyperbolicity is strictly stronger than Brody hyperbolicity. So if you have, there are non-compact manifolds, I mean, Kobayashi hyperbolicity still implies Brody hyperbolicity, but the converse is false. So for this theorem, this compactness is crucial. 
I mean, because people talk about, uh, you know, um, hyperbolicity of open varieties all the time as well. So let me point that out. Let, let me give you a simple example of such a thing because it's just cute. Um, say, consider the following domain in C2. So you take C2, <clears throat> you know, you look at pairs ZW where Z is less than one, the absolute, the, the, the absolute value of Z is less than one, and then the absolute value of ZW is less than one, okay? So if I just looked at that, right, what would happen here is that, you know, at, whenever Z is not equal to zero, right, whenever Z is not equal to zero, then you would have a disk, right? I mean, then, then you know, you would have the W is less than one over the, the, the absolute value of Z. But you see, when Z equals zero, then you would get the entire complex plane. But we don't want that. So we want this thing to be broadly hyperbolic. So what you do is you just remove, uh, you know, the W's with norm bigger than or equal to one. You can do this if you, you know, there's an open set still in C2. So it's nice domain, yeah? And I claim that it's Brody hyperbolic but not Kobayashi hyperbolic. So now why is this? So, you know, secretly, of course, what we did is that we had these disks where at the origin, they became larger and larger and at the origin, it became all of C. But what we did is by fiat, we removed uh, some part of that C. Now, why is this Brody hyperbolic? Okay, suppose that you have a map from C to this domain, right? Then I can follow this map by the projection to the Z axis. Well, I mean, Z less than one, right? I mean, like if I compose this map, right? Then this is a holomorphic map, which is bounded. Well, then Louisville's theorem tells you that that has to be constant, right? So by Louisville's theorem, we conclude that this composition is bounded. So that means that, you know, if you have such a holomorphic map from C to D, then the Z value has to be constant. Okay, but if the Z value is constant, then for any Z, this is a disk, right? I mean, like, you know, if I fix the Z, right, and the Z is not equal to zero, then this is the disk, W is less than one over Z. Again, by Louisville's theorem, it has to be constant. And if Z is zero, then that's like, you know, the W is less than one, that's also a disk. So it has to be constant. So you see that this is Brody hyperbolic. But of course, it's not Kobayashi hyperbolic because, you know, secretly there is a complex plane sitting in this thing that we sort of artificially removed, right? So like, why is this thing not Kobayashi hyperbolic? Because any point over the, over Z equals zero has distance zero. Now, how do you see that? Well, what you do is like this. So you go to Z, say that you are over Z equals zero and you have two points, yeah? Right nearby, there is a humongous disk, right? I mean, like, you know, if Z is like 0 0.0001, this like disk, one over 0 0.001, you know, is like, you know, radius a thousand disk or, you know, radius a billion disk, right? So, so there's a humongous disk nearby, right? So what you can do is you go a tiny bit to that humongous disk and there this distance is now tiny. So that you see that the distance between these things can be made less than epsilon over three for any epsilon. So that you see that the distance is zero. And so it's not Kobayashi hyperbolic, okay? So that's just a cute example that, um, you know, that tells you that you have to be a little bit careful for non-compacting. All right. I, yeah, I don't know who, this, this example is probably due to Brody. I'm not sure I didn't look up. Um, okay, if X is a, okay, so, so now here is for us, you know, remember that we are interested in curves on varieties, right? So for us, we are interested in curves on varieties, right? So from our perspective, you see the point is like this. If X is a Brody hyperbolic smooth projective variety, then X does not contain any rational or elliptic curves. In fact, it contains no abelian sub variety. Okay, now what's the reason? The reason is like this. I mean, you know, if you have X and this has a map from P1, right? If it has a non-constant map from P1, then it means C sits in the P1, right? So then you get a non-constant map. And if it has an elliptic curve, right? But the universal cover of an elliptic curve is C, 
right? And more generally, if it has an abelian variety sitting in X with a non-constant map, right? The universal cover of that abelian variety is CN. This is a complex torus, right? So it's a CN model lattice. So then, you know, in the CN, there are plenty of Cs and then you get non-constant maps, okay? So, so Brody hyperbolicity already implies that if you have a smooth projective variety, which is Brody hyperbolic, then it doesn't have any rational elliptic curve. And as I said, it also doesn't have any abelian varieties. Any map from an abelian variety would have to be constant. The reason for this, as I said, the universal cover on an abelian variety is CN, and then you know you can put lots of Cs in the CN and then project to get non 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 constant maps. Okay. But you, you know, so, so now that I've introduced this hyperbolicity, let me go back. Lang's initial ir, original goal was to generalize Fulton's theorem to higher dimensional varieties. And he settled on like the right, the right notion for being hyperbolicit. So what's the Lang conjecture? So let me tell you. And you know, some parts of this I should also attribute to Green and Griffiths. So um, anyway, so, so maybe here I should put some Green and Griffiths here too. Um, okay, so let X be a smooth projective variety of general type. So now what does that mean? General type means that, you know, if you look at the canonical, the canonical, pluricanonical maps, eventually you get a bi you get one birational one, okay? I mean, if you want to think about it, you can sort of, um, you know, <clears throat> One possible generalization, right, of curves of higher genus would have been that if you have a curve of higher genus, then the canonical is ample, right? What that means is that some multiple of the canonical, and unless you're hyperliptic, in fact, just the canonical itself gives an embedding of your curve into projective space, right? I mean, if you're not, if you're hyper elliptic, then that's not quite an embedding. So you have to look at two ice K or something like this, but ignoring hyper elliptic curves, right? Then, you know, the canonical map actually gives you an embedding. So, you know, one possible generalization of higher genus curves that you could have is that ask that the canonical be ample. In other words, some multiple the canonical given an embedding of the variety. But you know, if you just want to do arithmetic with that, then that's not such a good notion. Because you see, what you could do is that, <clears throat> yeah. I should be a little bit careful. I mean, like you, you see, like, <clears throat> or more generally, what you could say that that's a general type, meaning that some multiple of the canonical gives a, gives a map to project the space, a rational map, such that the image has the same dimension as X. Um, but you see, like, if you were to use such a, such a notion for arithmetic, what you could do is that that's a birational notion. So that you see, if I took my X and it had a rational point, then I could blow up that thing and put a, put a PN minus one in there, right? And that would have plenty of rational points. So if you want to get some sort of statement, right? that says that um, you know, there are only finitely many solutions to your equations, then it can't quite be a birational statement. It has to be a little bit more delicate than that, okay? And so here is what uh, Lang says. So suppose that we have a smooth projective variety of general type, okay? Then he wants to say that there exists a proper algebraic set Z, which will I'll call the Lang locus in the future, this is proper, meaning that it's not all of X, such that the following things happen. And, you know, for each property, this Z can be different, yeah, a priori. But let, let, let me just say it like this. Like, you know, for each thing, you might have a different Z. But anyway, so, so the first statement is that the images of non-constant maps from rational curves and abelian varieties are contained in the Z. <clears throat> okay. So, so, you know, I don't, the second is that, I guess maybe I should put green Griffiths here, uh -huh. that the images of non-constant maps from C to X are contained in the proper sub-variety. 
the complement of a proper subvariety is Kobayashi hyperbolic. And of course, from this perspective, the arithmetic one is that if X is defined over a number field and you have any finite extension of this number field, then in the complement of this Z, there are only finitely many points over this number field. Okay? So in particular, you know, what one part of what this is saying is that if you had like, you know, the, sort of another conjecture that he made is that if you have a hyperbolic manifold, then this should have only finitely many points over any number field. Okay. So, so that's the big conjecture. It's almost entirely open. Yeah. <clears throat> so let, let me just take a moment maybe to just go over it a little bit more slowly. So what this is saying is that if I have a variety of general types, so that's the canonical map gives, you know, um, you know, some multi-canonical map, some pluricanonical map gives, um, you know, <clears throat> gives or defines a rational map whose image is the same as the dimension of X, right? If you have such a variety and, you know, the example that you should again think is the, is, um, you know, curves of higher genus where the canonical map is almost always an embedding, right? E except if the curve is hyperelliptic. So then what you see is that then the conjecture is that first of all, you know, this might not be, it might not be hyperbolic because as I explained, you can always blow up a point, right? And put lots of projective spaces on this thing, right? So it might not be hyperbolic, but, you know, there are some proper sub-variety, proper algebraic sets such that in the complement, it's hyperbolic. And, you know, and furthermore, in the complement of some proper algebraic set, then there are only finitely many rational points. Anyway, this is one of the most fundamental open, uh, you know, one of the fundamental conjectures of arithmetic geometry, right? Um, so let, let's do some examples, yeah? Um, so, <clears throat> so let's do some examples. Of course, if you take a product of curves, all of genus at least two, then this is hyperbolic and sets by length conjectures by faulting the theorem, right? So then, yeah, you know, if you just take a product of curves, then this is okay. More generally, you see, if you have like vibrations, um, you know, what one point is that, I mean, we've already used this idea, but you know, if I have a smooth projective variety mapping to another one, right? And if I assume that Y is broadly hyperbolic and all the fibers of this map are broadly hyperbolic, then it follows that X is broadly hyperbolic, right? So the reason is that if I have a map from C to this, then you can compose it because Y is broadly hyperbolic, then it has to be constant, the composition has to be constant, but then so it must lie in the fiber, the fiber is broadly hyperbolic, so it has to be constant, okay? So like, you know, for instance, you can play some fun examples of broadly hyperbolic things. So for instance, let me take five lines in P2 in this configuration, three of the lines pass to one point and you know the other two meet one and the same point. Now see if you I do this then you get something broadly hyperbolic because you know if you look at the P1 minus three points, right, is hyperbolic. And then you know all the fibers are also P1 minus three points and things like this. So you can you can play with these kinds of things. Um, the other thing that I should say is that like, you know, there are deep theorems of fault things about sub-varieties of a billion varieties where the length conjectures are known. But that's wide open in general. You know, the case of, outside of the case of curves and certain sub-varieties of a billion varieties is wide open. And then let me point out that, you know, you need to have some assumptions here, right? Like if I have, for instance, an abelian variety, right? So this is a complex torus, right? So it's CN model lattice. So the universal cover is CN. So then you see what you can do is in the CN. So let me just do it as C2. Here is your lattice, right? What you could do is you could take an irrational C. So this is irrational, right? In fact, you can make it so that the projection to A is everywhere dense, right? So that the closure could be, the risky closure could be all of A. So, and, you know, the image, you know, of 
C mapping to X may not be algebraic, right? I mean, the Zariski closure might be of dimension bigger than one, yeah? <clears throat> so that you see that this hyperbolicity has an analytic aspect and an algebraic aspect. Yeah, you know, like if you want to show that something is um, something is hyperbolic, first you need to say that okay, the image of the C, yeah, maybe is a curve, and then you have to say that okay, there aren't such curves or something like this. And both of these things are hard problems in general. But so the, the thing to understand is that there's an analytic aspect and an algebraic aspect, and part of what the Lang conjectures are is that if X is of general type then such a thing cannot happen. You can't have a map from C to X whose images dance in the Zariski topology. Um, you know, this is also not known. So, <clears throat> I mean, you know, there are many techniques for approaching this, you know, going back to Bloch in the 1940s and, you know, Sue de Maia and many people have developed techniques for showing um, that the image um, of a map from non-constant holomorphic map from C to X is contained in the proper algebraic subvariety. The way these things work is that usually you look at these uh, jet bundles, and then you know these jet differentials. When you pull back to C, they have to vanish. And then what you do is you just do some riemann roch calculation to say that the jet differentials have lots of sections and then force these images to lie in the base locus of these things. And in particular, if you can so show that the base locus is empty, then you get that the variety is hyperbolic. So that kind of thing has been developed and there are lots of results in this, but that's not the direction that I wanna to discuss today. The, the way I wanna go instead is use a, you know, you use a different notion of hyperbolicity that sort of isolates the algebraic aspect. And this is due to de Maillet. So let me tell you what he says. So de Maillet's idea is that let's isolate the algebraic aspect out of this thing and study the analytic aspect and the algebraic aspect separately. So here is what he says. Suppose that you have a smooth projective variety defined over the complex numbers. So then we will say that X is algebraically hyperbolic, right? If the following happens, if there exists an epsilon greater than zero, such that for any curve, right? The geometric genus or like the, the Euler characteristic, you know, 2G minus two, like um, it is, or minus the Euler characteristic, if you want, 2G minus two, is bigger than or equal to this fixed epsilon times the degree of C. So in other words, as the degree of C grows, the geometric genus also grows, okay? So you can't have curves of low geometric genus in a curve class of high degree, okay? Uh, notice that, you know, we already said that Brody hyperbolic varieties don't have any rational elliptic curves. Of course, algebraic the hyperbolic varieties also don't have rational or elliptic curves, right? If I have a rational curve, then this is minus two. If I have an elliptic curve, this is zero. The degree is always positive. So, you know, this number has to always be positive. So it can't be minus two or zero, right? So algebraic, the hyperbolic varieties don't have any rational or elliptic curves. So, you know, Demey proves that actually Kobayashi hyperbolicity does imply algebraic hyperbolicity and conjectures that this is also true. The converse is also true for smooth projective varieties. This, of course, is wide open, right? <clears throat> um, and the thing to know is that in general, it's extremely hard to prove that the variety is hyperbolic, you know? <clears throat> You know, I gave you some examples where you can cheat and bootstrap from, you know, vibrations by curves or like, you know, products of curves or things like this. But, you know, if I give you a random variety, it's extremely difficult to know whether it's, um, they are hyperbolic. Um, and so from now on, I'll just talk about algebraic hyperbolicity. As I said, there are many results of the Maïs, you and many others. Uh, on hyperbolicity, on Kobayashi hyperbolicity of both hypersurfaces and complements of hypersurfaces and projective space. I'm not going to talk about these results, so I'll instead just um, 
concentrate on algebraic hyperbolicity. So you see, for hypersurfaces, the algebraic hyperbolicity is actually completely known for the general, very general hypersurface. So you know, when the dimension is at least four, right? These are results of Ein, Clemens, Ron, Wazan, and Pacienza that says that if you have a hypersurface, very general, you know, very general means that, you know, you make the equations really, the coefficients really random, or what it means is that in the complement of the countable union of proper algebraic varieties, right? So if you have a very general hypersurface of degree at least 2n minus 3, then it's algebraically hyperbolic. You see, this is sharp, right? Because yesterday we saw that if you have a hypersurface of degree less than or equal to 2n minus 3, it contains lines. So in particular, it cannot be hyperbolic. There is a rational curve. Um, so, um, <clears throat> and then you see the case of P3 turned out to be a little bit harder. So this is again, the theorem of Ein, Gang, Shu and uh, Eric Riedel and myself. So if you have a very general surface of degree at least five, then X is algebraically hyperbolic. So, you know, this was known by results of gang shu for d at least six but the case d equals five was basically the last remaining um case of the kobayashi conjecture for algebraic hyperbolicity that namely these varieties are all um hyperbolic and so then eric and i resolved this thing in a, a two years ago or something like that so um okay so and this is sharp as well, because, you know, if you make D equals four, and then that's a K3 surface, and these contain rational and elliptic curves. So they are not hyperbolic. So the, the, this is, for algebraic hyperbolicity, for hypersurfaces, we have a completely sharp um, characterization for the very general surface. Of course, <clears throat> uh, do, do I have a, let me maybe get the, get the, I didn't leave good, I didn't leave good spaces here. So, so you see, you can ask whether you can, you can weaken this very general assumption, right? So, so you see, it's clearly you need some generality assumption, right? Because we showed that we saw that like, you know, there are always hypersurfaces that have lines and things like this. So, you know, if you give yourself a rational curve, you might be able to put it in some hypersurface. So it's not going to be true for every hypersurface. But you know, you can ask whether you really need to remove like countably many sub varieties from the space of hypersurfaces, or whether it's enough to remove finitely many. Like for instance, you can ask, like this is already for quintic surfaces in P3 is not known. Can a quintic surface a smooth quintic surface. In P3, contain arbitrarily large degree rational curves. Arbitrarily large degree rational curves. Maybe the way I should say it is, can it contain arbitrarily large degree rational curves without containing any low degree rational curves or something like this? Maybe that's, I could ask it like that too. Anyway, but you can ask this question. I don't think we know the answer to that. <clears throat> but, you know, it's an interesting question. Okay, so how do you, so what I want to do today, maybe like remember the point of these lectures is sort of to explore normal bundles of rational normal bundles of curves, right? Uh, so the first two lectures, we sort of explored normal bundles of rational curves in various varieties. So in the last two lectures, today and tomorrow and Friday, I want to sort of explore rational normal bundles of higher genus curves. All right, so, but the question is, again, so I wanna come to, so I wanna explain the proof of this theorem. Um, and sort of explain the connection to normal bundles of curves and things like this. Okay, so, so this follows from the following theorem, right? So here is the theorem. 
So suppose that X in P3 is a very general surface of degree at least five. Then the geometric genus of any curve on X of degree D times K is at least this. Okay, so there is a bound on the geometric genus of a curve on a, on a very general surface of degree D at least five. Okay. Now, why does it follow? So from this, we need to show that like the very general surface degree at least five is algebraically hyperbolic. So let's take a look at that. So let's compute this 2G minus two. Let me remind you the definition of algebraic hyperbolicity. I'm supposed to find an epsilon such that 2G minus two is bigger than or equal to epsilon times the degree of the curve. All right, so we look at this 2G minus two, then you get this thing. The degree of the curve is DK. I mean, you see, if the D is at least six, right, then you can take epsilon to just be D minus five, right? Then that will work. And this epsilon is at least one. The difficulty is what happens when D equals five, right? The D equals five, then this drops out and you get K. But you see now you can take epsilon to be one fifth because, you know, the degree of the curve is 5k. So if I take epsilon one fifth, then this 2g minus two is bigger than or equal to one fifth times 5k. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. And then, you know, I should say that the improvements that we did with Eric was adding this plus k. Yeah. Without the plus k, basically, the, this was gang shoes bound on the genus. But, you know, this makes the, all the difference for the degree 5k. Okay, so this is so the get goal is to bound the genus of curves on these surfaces. Okay, so let's talk about what happens. Okay, um, so so the theorem that we need to prove is this: we need to say that you you have a bound on the genus of curves on the high, very general surface. All right, let's do it. So now, how how are we going to do this? So we have this curve. You see. If this curve were smooth, we would know what this genus was. The problem is that this curve, like, you know, might have singularities and it can have absolutely terrible singularities, right? So the goal is to sort of, in some sense, the goal is to bound the singularities of a curve. Okay, so now what we do is take the normalization of your curve. You have this curve; it's potentially a horribly singular, right? We it is reduced and irreducible, right? So, so take the normalization. So this is the normalization. Of course, this curve is now smooth. Right, the normal curve is smooth. So, um, okay. So now what we want to do is not surprising. We look at the normal bundle of this map, right? So what you could do is you have the tangent space to the normalization and you have the pullback, right? I'll call the, this is the normal sheaf. Now let's compute the degree of this normal sheaf, okay? So say that the degree of this normal sheaf is some alpha, okay? Okay. <clears throat> say that the degree of this normal sheaf is some alpha, then you see I can find the degree of this normal bundle because this I know. The tangent bundle of X has a degree four minus D, right? So if I pull this back, it has degree DK times four minus D. And if this thing has degree alpha, then this the degree of the normalization is, which has degree two minus two G has degree DK four minus D minus alpha, 
okay? So in other words, you learn that the 2g minus 2, the twice the genus minus 2 is given by this thing, okay? But you see, I mean, like, what I want to do is I want to give some lower bound on this alpha, okay? I want to give some lower bound on this alpha. Suppose that you could give a lower bound on this alpha. In particular, say that you could say that alpha is bounded by k minus dk, right? Then you would get that this two genus, is, this thing is bounded by this, okay? So the goal here, so in other words, <clears throat> the problem of bounding the geometric genus, right? basically is the same as bounding the degree of the normal sheaf, okay? So that, that's the goal. Again, you know, this is the... That's the degree, bounding the degree of this normal sheaf, okay? All right. So now, now let, let's see what happens. <clears throat> let's see what happens. So we, th this is the goal. So I hope like, uh, you know, somehow you can reduce all this hyperbolicity, all these difficult things at the end of the day as bounding the degree of this normal sheaf. Okay. <clears throat> all right, let, let's see how you do it. Let, let's first try to understand this. <clears throat> All right, suppose that you have, you have a generically injective map from, of degree E from a smooth curve C into projective space, okay? Let me assume that I pull back the cotangent bundle twisted by one of Pn, and let's say that this has a line bundle quotient of degree minus n, okay? Then the point is that this curve, the image of this curve is contained in the surface scroll. So what's the surface scroll? The surface scroll is like, you know, you have your curve. It's just a collection of a one parameter family of lines, right? <clears throat> All right, so the, que the point is that if you have a curve in projective space, and if you pull back the cotangent bundle of projective space, and it has a line bundle quotient, of small degree, then it means that the image of this curve is contained in the surface scroll of small degree, okay? So let's understand why that is. The reason is like this. So you start with the Euler sequence. So if you start with the Euler sequence, right? Let me start with the Euler sequence. Let me twist it by one and pull it back to C. If you pull twisted by one, you get omega pn twisted by one, or pn going to O of one. Now, if you pull it all back, then you have this picture. Okay. Now, what we are saying is that we have a quotient of this, right? So the point is that what's the degree of this? So the degree of this is e, the degree of this is zero. So the degree of this thing is minus e. So this has degree minus e, and we are saying that it has a quotient of degree minus n, okay? Well, so, so this, it has this quotient, okay, so it's fine. So, so look at the kernel. If you look at the kernel, then this has degree m minus e, okay? All right, so now let's have fun with this, right? So now notice that this f upper star omega pn of one was sitting this in this OCn plus one, right? And this s is sitting in here. So then if I compose it, then you see there's s sitting in OCn plus one. So now there is a quotient. This is now rank two. And the degree of this was m minus e. The degree of this is zero. The degree of this is e minus m, yeah? But now you see the universal property of projective space, right? Tells you that you get a map from this projectivization of this Q prime over your curve, which is now your surface scroll, right? It's 
embeds that projectivization into PN, right? Because I mean, you know, given, giving, a, giving a map from the scroll into projective space is the same as giving a quotient like this, right? <clears throat> okay, so then we have that. So then you see that I've gotten, so, so you know, the, then you see that you get the surface scroll and its degree is at most E minus M containing this FOC. So, you know, the way you should think about this is that, you know, it could be that the map is generically injective, in which case you get degree E minus M, but it could also be generically S to one. So like, for instance, like, you know, if you had your curve and like somehow the lines were going like this, that then, you know, in this picture it would be three to one, in which case the degree and projective space would be E to minus M over S, okay? But the key point here is that the degree is bounded by this. Okay. Um, all right. So now what's the consequence of this? The consequence of this is that if FC does not lie on a surface scroll of degree less than K, then any rank one quotient of this has degree greater than or equal to K minus. Okay. Now you see the point is like this. <clears throat> look at f upper star omega pn of one and say that you have a rank one quotient here right now of course the problem here is that this may have torsion right the way i said this thing was this was a line bundle quotient but you know nobody said that this map doesn't vanish right and in fact you see one thing that you have to worry about here is that you know this map might, this might have torsion, right? Because if this has some zeros, like, you know, if the singularity is really bad, then, you know, you might get some torsion there. But that doesn't bother, that only helps. That's the lucky thing about this, right? This may have torsion, but, you know, quotient out by the torsion, you get out. And here, of course, because here you have the torsion, you know, you can do this. Right, you can quotient out the torsion subsheaf with this, this, and then you have a quotient to this line bundle. And then I can follow this thing to get this line bundle quotient, right? But the key point here is that the degree of Q is bigger than or equal to the degree of L. And now L is a line bundle quotient. And if this has degree minus M, then we get that E minus M has to be bigger than or equal to K. In other words, minus M is bigger than or equal to K minus E. So in other words, there is a lower bound to the degree of the quotient that you can have. So, you know, unless this curve is contained in a special scroll, right, then you have some bound on the degree of this quotient to the quotient to this, right? Okay, so now, now let's, assuming that, <clears throat> okay, okay, so now let's see how you finish, how you finish, from, from this, what you can do. So now you see, we have X as a very general surface of degree D at least five, okay? Then we have the noether lefschetz theorem. The noether lefschetz theorem says that the Picard group of this X is just ZH. H is the hyperplane cost. So you see, what can happen is that, you know, if you have a surface of degree D, bigger, like, you know, if D is one, two, or three, then the Picard rank is always determine, you know, when it's P2, it's just one, when it's the quadric is two, when it's the cubic is seven, but, you know, and, but once you start, once the degree becomes four or more, right, then the Picard group can vary, like the rank of the Picard group can vary, like, for instance, you know, if you have like a surface that has a line on it, then that gives a new curve class, right, but you know, there might be a line and a disjoint conic or whatever. So there might be many curve classes on this thing, right? So, but the noether lefschetz theorem says that if you have a very general surface of degree at least four, then the only line bundles on this are the restrictions that the line bundles coming from projective space, okay? And again, so this is saying that on those kinds of surfaces, you don't have other curves. It's just like only hyperplane section, quadric section, and so on and so forth, right? So then the very general, oops. So, so, so that's where, you know, one place where we are using this very general assumption in saying that the Picard group is just generated by the hyperplane class, okay? 
But you see, then that means that the only curves on this X are complete intersection, okay? So now why is that? Well, say, look at OP3 of K mapping to X of K, right? So the only line bundles on this variety are things to form OX of K. Let me compute the sections, right? But you see, you look at OP3 of K minus D mapping to OP3 of K is multiplying by the equation of X. So this you multiply by the equation of X, then you have OX of K. But you see H1 of this line bundle is zero. So H naught here is surjective. In other words, what this is saying is that if you have a curve on your surface, that's, there is some surface in P3 such that that curve is the intersection of your surface with that. You, that ah, <laughs> start again. If you have a curve C on X, right? This is saying that there is some surface S in P3 such that the C is X intersect S, right? So in other words, all curves on um, this x are um, have degree d times k, k and they are complete intersections okay now of course if this curve were smooth then we would know its genus i mean you know if you have a curve of smooth curve of complete intersection of type d and k right then its genus is known right so the canonical bundle is with the brothers or C of minus four plus D plus K, right? So the genus is two G minus two is the degree of this thing is D K times D plus K minus four, right? If D is at least five, right? Th th then you, you see, you already get this bound. The problem as I explained before is that this curve can be singular. Now how can it be singular? Like for instance, if you have a linear section of the surface, right? Typically, it's a smooth plane curve of degree D, and it has genus D minus 1, choose 2. But it could become tangent at the point. It could become 2 times tangent at the point, 3 times tangent, to 3 times tangent, I mean, tangent at 3 points, and so on and so forth, right? When you worry that you could have a plane that's like a million times tangent to the surface, right? When we want to say that such a thing cannot happen, right? <clears throat> Like, you know, for instance, if you have a quintic surface, right, then the genus of such a thing as, you know, four times three over two is six. If you take a smooth hyperplane section, it will have genus six. But, you know, you might be worried that you might be able to find maybe a hyperplane section that's six times tangent, and then you get a rational curve. We want to say that that can't happen. Okay. In other words, we really want to compute the single, control the singularities of this. But anyway, so let's just see what are the degrees of the scrolls that can contain such a curve. Because this is a complete intersection, if this k is less than d, right, then the smallest degree surface containing c already has degree k, right? Because any surface, degrees, so in particular, any surface scroll containing c has degree at least k. And if k is bigger than d, right, since this surface degree d, is very general, for instance, is of general type. So it has no lines on it or anything like this, right? So it's not a scroll. Then any scroll actually containing C again has degree at least K. Okay? So then you see that if you have this curve, then you can't have a scroll of degree less than K containing it. Now, assuming that this normal bundle of normal sheaf of this map is the quotient of the cotangent of P3 pulled by one, right? Then we get that, you, you know, let Q be the image of this alpha, then Q is of rank one, right? And it's a quotient like this. So then you see that the degree of this normal bundle is greater than or equal to the degree of this Q is bigger than or equal to K minus DK. And hence, by what we said, right? By what we had before, where were we? If we could say that this alpha was bigger than K minus DK, then you get this genus bound that we want, okay? So you see, the whole point boils down to the positivity of this normal bundle, right? How am I going to get that this normal bundle is a quotient like this with torsion kernel? That's what I need to do, right? So this is the, 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 the key positivity. If you have this kind of positivity, then by combining it with the scroll argument, then you can get this genus bound. So the whole thing boils down to the getting the positivity of this normal bundle. How do you do it? And this is the argument that goes back to Ein. 
So it was first Ayn who developed this argument. Then was uh, improved that Pachanza further improved the Clemens and Rand further, further improved it, and so on and so forth. But so there is a technique for getting the positivity here. Okay, so let, let, let me explain this a tiny bit. Again, this goes back to work of mine in the early 80s, then, then was, uh, I guess, in the late 90s, and Pachianza early 2000s, and Clemens and Ram early 2000s. Okay, so now how does this argument work? So, like, how do we get positivity? The idea is. You, you know, I mean, if I give you a single hypersurface, you have no way to get your hands on this thing. But the idea of Ein is to look at the universal family of hypersurfaces. What you do is you look at all hypersurfaces together. And by doing this, then you can get positivity. Okay. So now what do you do? So you look at, you know, all hypersurfaces of degree D or all equations of degree D, right? And you suppose that a general hypersurface, and you know, the Ein uh, was um, Pachian's the thing is more general. Like they, it doesn't only work for curves. I mean, you can say that, you know, the theorem that they prove usually is of the form that every sub variety of a very general hypersurface is of general type. I mean, for curves, general type usually mean, general type means that the genus is at least two, but you, you know, they get bounds for in every dimension, not just for curves. But, you know, just to keep life simple, I'll pretend that we are just doing curves here, okay? But I should point out that they prove more, right? So, um, okay. So, so you see, say that you have some variety Y. For us, it's a curve of genus G or something like this. And say that I can map a curve of genus G always into no matter what X I have, there is a map. But, you know, I could have done this, like, you know, maybe I have a rational surface or I have some other kind of surface that I like, or, you know, maybe I have a threefold that I care about. So you, you could run these arguments more generally. But anyway, let's not do that. Suppose that we have our very general surface. No matter what surface of degree D I, find, I have, I can find the curve of genus G like this, right? Now, you see, the basic observation is that now you can put all these things in the nice family. I mean, basically, what do you do? You take the whole all Hilbert scheme of this thing, you take a component that dominates it, and then, you know, you can then just slice this thing so that there are only finitely many in each X, and then, you know, then make a base change and so on and so forth. So, that, so, so you know, what you can do is if you make an at all base change, yeah? Then what you could do is you could look at the universal hypersurface. What does it mean to look at the universal hypersurface? Let me remind you, the universal hypersurface is this thing. <clears throat> Px such that P is contained in X, right? So over this P n plus D to D minus one or SD if you are doing it by equations, okay? So you look at the, you pull back the universal hypersurface and over this, you see, Basically, like you can assume that you have one curve of genus G on each hypersurface. You know, after throwing out some bad loci and making the base change, you can always get it to the situation. As I said, what you do is you look at the Hilbert scheme, you slice it to get finitely many. You know, if there's somewhere there are infinitely many, you toss those out. So, you know, this U can be an open set, and that's how, you know, you know, a cover of an open set. This thing. Okay. Anyway, so the, the first thing you do after some nonsense is you get yourself into a nice situation where, you know, you have your family of hypersurfaces, you know, the ge very general hypersurface occurs in this family, and in each one you have some curve of genus G, okay? You can do a few more things, like you can, for instance, assume that when you build this thing, pay a little bit attention so that it's actually PGLM plus one equivariant. So that you see the PGLM plus one acts on PN, right? And when you make your slicing and choosing these things, you can make sure that you, you make the whole thing PGLM plus one equivariant, okay? All right, so then you see, we want to get, so the point is that there is more positivity here. And we understand the tangent bundles of this universal hypersurface better. And there is more positivity and more games that we can play. So we want to leverage the positivity of this universal hypersurface to get some positivity on the individual fibers. Okay. 
All right, so let's do this. How do you do it? So first of all, what you do is the universal hypersurface we understand. You see, it maps on the one hand to Pn by projection to the point. On the other hand, it maps to this U or like, you know, this, right? And, <clears throat> You, you know, you can pull back the tangent bundle of Pn, and this is what we call the vertical tangent sheet, okay? Similarly, there is a vertical, there is a vertical tangent sheet for y. So now what you could do is you could pull back pi to upper star of f upper star of Pn, right? So, you know, I can, so y is mapping to this x by f, I can further pull the tangent bundle there. The tangent bundle of y, this is surjective. You see, um, in what I'm going to say maybe in a little bit later, this map might not be surjective, but here it's surjective because we assume that this is PGLM plus one invariant. Because it's PGLM plus one invariant, then this map is surjective, and this is the vertical tangent she for y, the kernel. All right. So now you see the situation is like this. We are interested in the generic X here. So I take a random T here and I look at the fiber XT. And I want to say that actually there is no map from YT to XT if this genus is small, right? So that's the kind of game that I want to play, right? So then you see, we want to understand the normal bundle of this YT and XT, or let me call this FT. We want to understand the normal sheaf of FT. Somehow we can understand the normal sheaf of y in x relatively easily. But the goal is that we want to really understand this. Luckily, it turns out that they have really nice relations, OK? So as I said, let's look at ft mapping yt to xt. This is a particular hypersurface and a particular curve in the hypersurface, right? And then you see, I have the global one. So this is this family of the y's. This is the family of the x. That's the normal bundle of this map. F, remember, is the map from y to x. OK? So it turns out that you know this normal bundle of ft. So, so, and of course, yt sits in y, right? I mean, this is just, let, let me call the inclusion jt, because there are a lot of pullbacks and stuff in here. So it turns out that this normal bundle of this FT for the individual one is nothing other than just you take the normal bundle of F, right, which sits on Y and just you pull it back. Okay. Again, you know, this is you need to chase some sort of sequences to see this, but you know, it's not, you know, this, these things are not that difficult. You just have to the hardest thing in this thing is the notations, hence it's the worst thing to explain on Zoom, right? So um, I, I, you see, the point is that you have some sequences. On the one hand, I have TY mapping to X, mapping to this NF, right? On the other hand, YT mapping to XT, mapping to NFT, right? So what you do is uh, you, you look at, so, you know, I want to say that this is the same as that, right? So instead, what you do is you look at this way. It turns out that both of these are trivial bundles. So there's an isomorphism there. Then by chasing the sequence, you get that there's an isomorphism there. OK? Anyway, the, the, this, is, this is better than at home with pieces of paper like, rather than me putting infinitely many symbols, none of which you remember on the board. OK? So, so but the point is that you know the normal bundle that we want to understand the, the upshot of this thing, the normal bundle that we want to understand actually boils down to understanding the universal one. And the point being that the universal one has more positivity and we can get our hands on it, okay? There is one other thing that you need to know. Like, you know, I have this thing and I have this co-kernel, right? You can also view this normal bundle in terms of this co-kernel. Again, it's a similar sequence that I'll just... OK, now the advantage of this thing is that we understand this one, the tangent bundle of X over PN. The vertical tangent bundle is easy to understand. Because I mean, you know, at the end of the day, this thing is given by polynomials of degree D. So what is the map, right? So the way you define the vertical tangent bundle, right? So, so you know, I have my OPN mapping to SD, mapping to OPN of D. So like, you know, if I look at the universal hypersurface, right? 
if you look at pn cross this p n s d right then how do you define the universal hypersurface you have the p and the f right and the equation defining this is that f of p maybe let me call this big f we already have some small f this is the equation of the hypersurface and like what does defines the universal hypersurface the what defines the universal hypersurface is fp equals zero right now you know you can find the tangent shift to this thing in the normal shift or whatever right by just differentiate like you know it's, you know what the equation is so it's um it's easy to determine what it is and in fact what it is is the what's called the Lazarsfeld mukaiba yeah, so, so you see, you have a map from OPN to OPN of D. <clears throat> so, so, you know, you have all the sections. So, you know, this is age not of OPN of D, right? So, so this is the evaluation map, right? So you have this kind of thing. So the kernel of this map is called the Lazarsfeld mukai bundle. And this vertical tangent sheaf is essentially the, this Lazarsfeld mukai bundle, okay? Now, you see, we eventually, like, what's the goal? <laughs> Let's go back to the goal, yeah? The goal was to say that this normal bundle that we have gets a map from the cotangent bundle of P3 twisted by one, right? Okay, so how do we do it? But you see, now we are very close, right? Because first of all, we have this vertical tangent bundle, which we related to this normal bundle, right? And now it's, this Lazarsfeld Mukai bundle. Now you see <clears throat> what was and Pacienza, Clemens, and Ron prove is that now look at the Lazarsfeld Mukai bundle for O of one. So, in other words, look at O tensor H not of O of one mapping to O of one and the co kernel here. Now, the co kernel here is, of course, the cotangent bundle of PN twisted by one. This you can call it if you want this Maslow's Fal Mukai bundle or whatever, yeah. <clears throat> but you know it, this is really the cotangent bundle, right? Now the key point that they prove is that there is so you can take direct sums of this so that it surjects onto this K bundle that we have, yeah, this co-kernel. Okay, there is some integer s, and then the game they play is sort of controlling this s, right? But for us, we don't care so much about this. And how do they do this? The way they do this is that you see you have a map from this M1 to this MD. Remember, this MD is this vertical tangent bundle, and K is the K is the quotient of that, right? So if I want to get a surjective map like this, it's enough to get a surjective map onto this vertical tangent bundle. And that vertical tangent bundle is essentially this Rezusfeld Mukai bundle for D. Right, but how do you get like from the Lazarsfeld well, Mukai bundle for one to the Lazarsfeld well, Mukai bundle for D? Basically, if you pick any polynomial of degree D minus one, you get a map like that. What we want to do is that we want to make it surjective. Well, I mean, you know, basically what you're asking is that how can multiplying a polynomial of degree D minus one, right, by linear polynomials, how can I get all degree D polynomials? I and mean, what's clear is that eventually you get them all, right? But of course, the game that Clemens and Rand and company have to play is they need to do it efficiently, right? You want to take as few as possible degree D minus one polynomials, such that if you multiply them by linear polynomials, you eventually get all degree D polynomials, right? So that's what you, the game that you want to play, but we don't care, right? In our case, this K is rank one, right? So. And we don't quite need to get surjective. We just want to get generically non-zero map, right? Because it's rank one and so on and so forth, right? But so, you know, in other words, for us, what we get is that, you know, by the Clemens run was an Ein Pachian's argument is that even if I take S equals one, there is one for which I get the generically surjective map, yeah? So that you see the combining all of the stuff, right? you get, if Y is a family of curves, you get a map like this with torsion co-kernel, which is what we wanted to do. Remember going back, um, I mean, so what, what we are doing is much easier than what I and company have to do. Here, here, 
here, assuming that we had this map, right, with tors and co-kernel, then we knew that everything worked out. And, you know, this ein was on Pachianza Clemens run machi machinery tells us that we can do that. Anyway, I wanted to explain the positivity a little bit because this is a very powerful technique that has led to lots of interesting, uh, <clears throat> lots of interesting results. Anyway, so maybe let's just to wrap up what that says is that now we've completed sort of the sketch of the proof of the theorem. And what we've learned is that the genus, eh, where is it? Let me find the theorem again. Um, I think the theorem is here. So where we got is that the genus, you know, of a very, of a curve where on a very general surface degree five is at least this. <clears throat> so that, that, that tells us the algebraic hyperbolicity. All right, so that was probably a little bit difficult to follow. So sorry about that. Um, I mean, you know, the point is that you can use this technique, you know, much more generally. I mean, you know, no, like, you know, given any variety, you can use this technique and try to characterize algebraic hyperbolicity. And in fact, you know, Hasse and Nilsson started doing this thing for threefolds, and then, you know, Eric and I did the sharp results. So, you know, if you have a threefold in a very general surface, you can ask in some linear system, you can ask when is it algebraically hyperbolic? And, you know, you, you can tell this thing, for instance, if I, instead of P3, now I take P1 cross P1 cross P1, right? And say that I have a surface, this should have been H1, H2, H3. Um, so I pull back, you know, the hyperplane cross from each of the projections. Say that I have a surface like this. When is it algebraically hyperbolic? You can say that it's algebraically hyperbolic if all the, all the AIs are bigger than or equal to three, or if one of the AIs is two, the others have to be at least four, okay? And similarly, you know, you can say when is the surface in P2 cross P1 algebraically hyperbolic? Again, you know, if H1 is the pullback of the hyperplane class from P2 and H2 is the pullback of the hyperplane class from P1, then, you know, you get something algebraically hyperbolic if A is at least four and B is at least three, or if B is two, A is at least five. Anyway, you can do the same thing for, you know, blow ups of P3 at a point or like, you know, Here's the roof surface corpse P1, you know, way that projects the spaces of various kinds and things like this. I mean, that, that's a general technique. There is nothing special to P3. The, the slight bit of complication that you get in the story is that if you're applying it to a variety that's not homogeneous, then this map is not going to be surjective necessarily, but like, you know, generically surjective or something like that. And then when you trace these things, you pay a little bit more attention. But anyway, since so you can pay attention, okay? All right, so going back to the question we asked today, right? Yeah, what we asked yesterday. So what was the question that we asked yesterday? We asked if I have a hypersurface of degree D in projective space, for which pairs of genus and degree does there exist the curve of degree and genus, geometric genus G, right? Um, that's the question we asked, right? And now, you know, for very general surface in P3, and, and of course, in general, like, the, you know, the Wazan, Ein, and Pachian's argument do it also for hypersurface in higher dimensions. Um, they give bounds when there can exist such a curve, right? Um, this is also interesting, by the way, for higher dimensional varieties. One of the more interesting problems of birational geometry is the following question. Like, if I fix an X, when does that contain a rational surface? You know, what one would like to say is that even if you have a Fano hypersurface, right? So say, say that you have a surf in PN, say that you have a hypersurface degree roughly at N, let, let's say equal to N, yeah? Th then what you want to say is that such a, such a surface, such a hypersurface, does actually does not contain any rational surfaces. I mean, you know, so if, if you look at special surfaces, you can prove this. And Beheshti and Riedel have a lot of results sort of giving partial results. And Beheshti and Star have partial results. 
But basically, if you do bogus dimension counts, right, just like similar to the rest, to the curve case that we did last time, right, you see that you, you don't expect any rational surfaces, at least if n is large enough, right? So it would be very interesting to know whether there can be rational surfaces on such a hypersurface. And now what would be the consequence? So you see, last time we talked about rationality. Remember, a variety is rational if it's birational to project a space. Unirationality, a variety is unirational if it admits a map from Pn, a rational map from Pn. And rationally connected was, uh, you know, if you could connect any two points by a rational curve. So, you know, there are obvious implications between these. Rationality goes to, un is implies unirationality and implies rationally connectedness, right? If I have a map from Pn to X, right? Then I can take all these, like, you know, if you have two points, you look at the inverse image of those two points and you look at the line between them and then the line goes to some sort of rational curve between those two points or something. Yeah, so, so these implications are clear. We saw last time that this implication did not hold, right? That was the, you know, famous theorem of Clemens Griffiths and then Art and Mumford and Iskowski Manin and so on and so forth. There are many examples, right? And of course, this implication is also expected to fail, but we don't know any examples where it fails. I mean, you know, for instance, it's expected the hypersurf tunnel hypersurfaces of degree close to n and pn. They are certainly rationally connected by Maury's theorem, but they are not supposed to be unirational. And you know, one way to distinguish between them, suggested by Janos Kolar, was that you know, um, if you have a unirational variety, right, then it has plenty of rational surfaces, plenty of rational threefolds. Basically, you know, if you look at your PN and look at planes in there, or P3s in there, or P4s in there, right, the images of those things give you rational varieties of larger dimension. But there is absolutely no reason why, like, you know, if random funnel variety should contain any rational surfaces. So, so it's highly expected that this implication fails, but there are no known examples. So, you know, for instance, if you could exp you could prove this thing negatively that, you know, if you have a hypersurface degree n in Pn and it doesn't contain any rational surfaces, you would actually produce an example. But going back to sort of this more simple-minded question, maybe just for surfaces in P3, you see, if I have a surface, a very general surface in P3 of degree D, right? You can ask, what are the possible genera of curves that occur in the surface? You know, when the degree is one, then you have P2, then of course, every curve sits in P2 birationally, right? You know, you can put your curve in projective space and take a general projection and project it to P2. It won't in general be a smooth projection that will have some singularities, but you know, you can put it. And in fact, you can put it so that the curve is nodal, the only singularities are nodes. If the degree is two or three, then in fact, all genera occur. And in fact, as opposed to degree equals one, you can make it so that you have smooth curves of every genus in these surfaces. So for instance, if you look at P1 cross P1 and you look at the curve of class two G plus one, two comma G plus one. So a quadric surface is P1 cross P1. So, you know, like, you know, a curve in this is given by a bi-homogeneous equation and by degree something. If you look at the general one of degree two G plus one, then that has genus G and a smooth. So, you know, when the degree of the hypersurface is one, two, or three, then you can find, you know, you can find all curves in these surfaces, except by, at, at least by rationally. When the degree is four, then you have a K3 surface. And again, all genera occur. You have curves of all genera. Um, but, you know, once the degree is at least five, right? It's no longer true that all genera occur, right? For instance, we proved that you know genus zero and one curves don't exist, right? Because we showed that these are algebraic and hyperbolic. So you see, the problem point here is that we don't have a complete classification of the gaps. Yeah, you know, just from the fact that the genus is bigger than this, right? You can see that there are some gaps in the genera that occur, but. Um, we don't know what the gaps are. There is no complete uh, 
complete classification of these gaps. There is some work of, uh, I'm blanking on the names right now. One of the authors is Chiliberto. Um, so, you know, there has been some work in exploring these gaps, but, you know, <clears throat> but, but we don't know a complete classification of these gaps. The other question that you can ask to improve this bound, right? Like, like what get led to this bound was to ask like which scrolls contain these curves, right? The question that we asked is which scrolls contain these curves? And, you know, we gave a very crude bound on the degree of that scroll. We just said that, you know, if it covered degree DK, then it can't be containing a scroll of degree less than K. But, you know, likely the degree of the scroll that contains this curve is much larger so that you have a much better bound. So here is a question, and I don't know which way to bet on this thing, right? <clears throat> so you could ask, what is the smallest degree scroll containing occur or a curve on the surface of degree at least five, very general surface of degree five and P3? You know, here is a guess for such a scroll. So you have your curve and say that it has a really singular point. Say that it has a really singular point. So this is my really singular point. Then what I could do is I could take a cone over this curve with vertex at that point. So that would be a scroll that contains this curve, right? And you know the question is whether that's the best you can do. Um, you know, is that really the best you can do? And if that were true, then you would get a much better bound on the genus, and that would be bounded by this. I mean, I hope I copied this correctly. It doesn't matter what it is, but you know, you, you can work it out assuming that the degree of the scroll containing this curve is actually um, um, much larger, then it gives you a much larger genus bound. Anyway, I don't know the answer to this question. And I'm not even bold enough to conjecture, conjecture it to be true. So I'll leave it as a question. Okay. Um, Maybe let me say one more thing and then stop there. So you see, even when X is not algebraically hyperbolic, you can ask to characterize the Lang locus. And just to recall, what was the Lang locus if we find the Lang conjectures again? Okay, let's go back to the Lang conjectures, right? Lang conjectures are saying that there exists some proper algebraic set, right? Such that outside this proper algebraic set, this variety has to be uh, you know, Kobayashi hyperbolic or whatever, right? Um, or have only finitely many rational points or whatever property that he wants, okay? So, so, but, you know, even when you have a variety that's not algebraically hyperbolic, now you can ask the question, can you characterize the Lang locus? <clears throat> yeah? So, for instance, if we have a very general hypersurface, right? If D is bigger than 2n minus 3, then, you know, we know that X is algebraically hyperbolic here. I should say N is at least 4. four, four. Yeah, by Ein was N Pacienza. And we know that if D is less than or equal to 2n minus 3, X contains Y, so it's not algebraically hyperbolic. But then you can ask, okay, suppose that I have a very general hypersurface degree less than 2n minus 3. Can I say what the Lang locus is? Okay, I mean, of course, this thing contains lines, right? So it's not going to be algebraically hyperbolic. And then the union of the locus of these lines have to be in the Lang locus, right? So the theorem is like this. Um, so let me point out this theorem and maybe let me stop there for today. Um, so this again with Eric Riedel. Um, so it says the following thing. Suppose you have a very general hypersurface degree at least 3n plus 2 over 2. Okay, then you see on this X, I have the locus covered by lines. I have all these lines. So let me call ZL the locus covered by lines. Okay, then the theorem is that any curve not lying on the ZL. So, you know, if, like if I have a curve that's not contained in the ZL, like something like this, then actually its geometric genus is at least this degree. Okay, so that in particular, X is algebraically hyperbolic outside of the CL so that you can take the Lang locus in this case 
And let me point out, this is for algebraic hyperbolicity to be this locus E out. And in general, you can ask this question, you know, as I make this degree smaller, what happens? So, you know, one guesses that basically if D is bigger than roughly four thirds and then you can ask whether it's just the union of lines and conics, is that really the Lang locus and so on and so forth? Um, you know, there are lots of interesting questions um, that one can ask, but um, we don't know the answer to those, so let me stop there. <clears throat> All right, any question? I have a question. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, um, well, you know, in the first lecture, you mentioned that if you uh, take a general, if, you, if somebody gives you a bundle on P1, you know, then it splits into a sum of line models and you said you expect it to be uh, a balanced bundle. Yeah. So I was wondering, uh, let's say you start with a fab of curves like this, you know, and if you're trying to find out which kind of curves uh, live on a general hypercircle and so on. So if you look at any of the, uh, let's say a covering family of curves and you take a suitable line model and you uh, get a map to P1, so uh, can you say something about uh, a push, the push forwards of you know, O1 or any, any special bundles on these curves? Can you say how the splitting type will be on the E1? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so, so let me maybe repeat the question so if, to make sure that I understood correctly. So, so, so if I understand correctly is we have a curve and a map to P1. Right. Right. So, you know, one question that you can ask is what happens if I push forward this? Then I get a vector bundle on P1, right? Um, you know, I think what happens here is that then all P1 sits in it and then you get a, wait a minute. Is that right? Well, yeah, it will be all P1 uh, plus a direct sum of uh, negative line bundles. Plus a direct sum of negative line bundles. Yes, okay. then you can ask, I think, whether, like more generally, I mean, in fact, this question has been considered more generally. So suppose you don't even have to have P1, say that you have C and C prime, right? Okay. And you have a surjective map, these are two curves, right? The question that you can ask is you can look at this and then you have all C prime sitting in here and then there's some bundle in there, yeah? Then you can ask whether this is stable, okay? And there are some theorems that say that under certain conditions, this bundle is stable, but it's not very well understood this. And again, like, you know, you, you can say that you expect, you know, you expect this thing to be balanced. There are some situations where it's known to be balanced and some situations where it's known not to be balanced. So like, it depends a little bit on the curve and the, the way you're getting the map. Um, but, you know, it's a good question and it sort of leads to the question that I'm going to ask next time, which is on Friday. So like you see, so what we said is that if you have a rational curve, then you, know, you expect the normal bundle to be balanced. So now you see, suppose instead of a rational curve, you have a higher genus curve and maybe in projective space, right? Or some variety. Now we are going to ask what kind of normal bundle do you expect and do you expect it to be stable? So we are going to study this question and basically say that, you know, the normal bundle of higher genus curves and projective space should be stable most of the time. Okay, but it is a good, this is a good question and there are some, there is an extensive literature on this question, which I I, you know, I can email you. I don't immediately remember the names of the papers now, but like I, I'll but, send you, I'll send you an email uh, with a couple more questions, and you can probably like, sure, sure. I mean, it is a good question, and it's been considered. Thank you. I mean, you know, because like you know, when people were studying moduli spaces of vector bundles, like the question was whether you can get all the stable bundles this way, or like what's like. This kind of stuff has been considered in the literature. But as far as I know, there isn't like 
a pure, a very clean answer to that. Because uh, if, if you want your, uh, let's say if you're looking at maps uh, from C to P1 and you want this co-kernel of OP1 to F node star OC, yeah. if you want that to be balanced, then you'll have to have, that will have to be a direct sum of O minus one. Right. Uh, and that seems like a very uh, sort of rigid condition to put on, uh, on, on this curve. I don't know, maybe it is written, but maybe it's not, but I have a feeling that it seems too special if I just take a curve and, uh, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, except that that's the generic situation, right? Yeah, that's why, that's why I, I was, I was, that's what mystified me when you made this comment in the first lecture. It completely right. threw me out because I just couldn't uh, get a grip over that. But, but yeah, I'll think more about it. Yeah. Thanks. I mean, you know, the other place where this has been studied, right, like fairly recently, is on the brill noder theory of. Yeah. Curve. So, like, you know, if you have a k gonal curve, right? If you have a k gonal curve, like, you know, then, um, you know, you can ask for the splitting type of the scroll. You know, that, that usually goes under the name of what you do. Um, with the Maroni invariant, right? And for the trigonal curves, it's called the Maroni invariant, but you can generalize it in general, right? And, and then, like, you know, it turns out that, you know, if you want to understand the Brill Noether theory of a curve of low gonality, then, like, basically those Maroni invariants completely determine what kind of picture you have. <laughs> so, you know, you, you can look in that literature as well. Thanks. Any other question? So thank you very much for the nice talk.